Number 7. Andrei Gorbatyuk In April 2019, a Ukrainian tattoo artist named Tatyana Podvashetskaya was found murdered in a pool of blood at her apartment in Ternopil. Her landlord made the horrifying discovery when they went to do some repairs on the unit and immediately called for help. A neighbor who caught a glimpse of the crime scene told reporters that he could see a knife sticking out of Tatiana's stomach. Forensic examiners determined that the 27-year-old had been dead for around six hours when her body was found. Her midsection had been stabbed multiple times and there were fresh bite marks on her neck. Tatiana was last seen alive in the company of 26-year-old Andrei Gorbatyuk, who transformed his appearance to resemble a vampire with Tatiana's help. The two friends had previously made headlines when Tatiana dyed Gorbatyuk's eyeballs black. He also had vampire teeth, a split tongue, and magnets implanted in his head so he could wear horns. According to Ukrainian news outlets, Tatiana was supposed to tattoo Gorbatyuk on the day of her murder. They got into an argument, though, and Gorbatyuk apparently flew into a homicidal rage. Details on the case are somewhat scarce, leaving the nature of the disagreement unclear. But Gorbatyuk was found guilty of Tatiana's murder and was sentenced to life in prison as a consequence. Number 6. Edward O'Neill in 2016, a Houston teenager and self-proclaimed Satan worshipper named Edward O'Neill Sr. was accused of killing his best friend Ryan Roberts, who was found stabbed to death in a wooded area. O'Neill allegedly admitted to the murder and said that he carried it out as part of a satanic ritual. The suspect has a documented history of mental illness, putting the question of his competency to stand trial at the center of the case. But despite his confession, O'Neill was released on a reduced bond in 2020 after spending four years in custody. He was still awaiting trial three months later when he was charged with killing his cousin's ex-boyfriend, 39-year-old Derek Mike. According to reports, O'Neill gunned the victim down in a parking lot. Mike survived long enough to describe the shooter to investigators and died from his injuries the next day. O'Neill reportedly admitted to shooting Mike, but claimed that he committed the crime at his cousin's urging after she found out the victim had cheated on her. The second killing understandably left families feeling outraged that O'Neill was released while facing a murder charge in the first place. He was taken into custody and was held without bail, but there have been no recent updates on the case since late 2020. This indicates that O'Neill's questionable mental health has continued to delay the court proceedings. Number 5. Adolfo Constanzo While living in Miami during the late 1970s and early 80s, a Cuban-American teen named Adolfo de Jesus Constanzo began practicing a religion called Palo Mayombe, which involves animal sacrifices. He eventually moved to Mexico City, where he established a lucrative business performing Palo Mayombe rituals for superstitious cartel members, corrupt police officers, and other high-ranking members of the criminal underworld. And like many people who fall into a position of leadership, Constanzo, who called himself El Padrino, or the Godfather, became increasingly power-hungry as more and more people turned to him as their spiritual guru. His followers truly believed that his rituals ensured successful drug runs and protection from law enforcement. Constanzo sacrificed chickens, goats, snakes, zebras, and even lion cubs for his high-paying clients. He eventually began stealing corpses out of graveyards and started using them in his ceremonies, believing that human remains would have a more powerful effect on the outcome of his spells. And when that wasn't enough to fuel Constanzo's quest for spiritual dominance, he moved on to performing live human sacrifices. More than 20 innocent people were brutally murdered as offerings to the Palo Mayombe gods. Their dismembered remains were dumped at various places in and around Mexico City, and at least seven cartel members mysteriously vanished after refusing to let Constanzo become a partner in their business. The cult managed to evade suspicion from law enforcement until they kidnapped an American college student named Mark Kilroy, who was vacationing in Matamoros for spring break in early 1980. Costanzo tortured Kilroy, hacked him to death with a machete, and then boiled his brain in a cauldron. Mexican federal police caught a huge break in the case when they noticed a vehicle evading a drug checkpoint and followed it to a ranch. 
They arrested several suspects and made them dig up human remains at the property. And in total, 15 bodies were exhumed and a shack that the cult used for performing their ceremonies was burned down. Costanzo and several other suspects remained at large for several weeks. But authorities tracked them down to Costanzo's apartment in Mexico City. Not wanting to face accountability for his crimes, Costanzo ordered one of his cult members to kill him. Everyone else in the apartment was apprehended after a 45-minute shootout with law enforcement. Altogether, 14 people were convicted on charges relating to the cult's crimes, including Costanzo's lover and right-hand woman, Sara Aldretti. American authorities plan to prosecute Aldretti for Kilroy's murder if she's ever released from the Mexican prison where she's currently serving a 62-year sentence. It's unfortunate, but there's two suspects who were never captured and remain at large. Number 4. Rod Ferrell Rod Ferrell became obsessed with a vampire role-playing game during the 1990s when he was a teenager living in Kentucky. And his fantasy spilled over into real life when he began claiming that he was a 500-year-old vampire named Visago and developed a fascination with the occult. Then, eventually, Ferrell gained a handful of dedicated followers who drank each other's blood and engaged in other ritual practices together. In 1996, a young woman from Eustis, Florida named Hella Wendorf told Ferrell she wanted to run away and join his group, claiming that her home life was hell. Then, just days before Thanksgiving, Ferrell and three of his cult members drove to Eustis. After picking up Heather, Ferrell dropped her and two other group members off somewhere with plans to return for them later on. And that's when he returned to Heather's house with fellow group member Howard Scott Anderson and bludgeoned Heather's parents to death with a crowbar. Before fleeing the scene, Ferrell burned his signature V-shaped cult mark into the body of Heather's father, Richard Wendorf. By the time Richard and his wife Naomi Ruth Queen were found dead later that evening, the vampire teens were already on the run. They drove through four states over a four-day period as law enforcement worked to track them down. Authorities located the suspects in Louisiana with help from the grandmother of Charity Kesey, who was traveling with the group and had called her grandmother to ask for money. The grandmother directed the teens to a Howard Johnson hotel in Baton Rouge, where police were waiting at the property when the group arrived. Farrell took sole credit for the murders and consistently maintained that Heather never asked him to kill her parents. Authorities charged Farrell, Anderson, Charity Kesey, and a fourth suspect named Dana Cooper in connection with the disturbing double homicide. Then in 1998, Farrell pleaded guilty to the murders. He was originally sentenced to death, but his sentence was later commuted to life without parole. Anderson was convicted of murder and received a life sentence, which was eventually reduced to 40 years. But he'll become eligible for parole in 2031. Charity Kesey was convicted of two counts of third-degree murder and served a ten-and-a-half-year prison sentence, while Dana Cooper served 17 years for the same charges. The women have since been released, and Heather Wendorf was never charged in connection with the case. Number 3. Pazuzu Algarad As a teenager, John Alexander Lawson was given a lot more freedom than most of his peers. He was basically allowed to do whatever he wanted and had the full run of the house he shared with his mother in Clemens, North Carolina. The home became a social hub for deviant adolescents and young adults who latched onto Lawson as a sort of cult leader despite the fact that he was very obviously mentally ill. Over the years, Lawson developed his own twisted brand of Satanism, which could perhaps best be described as a combination of heavy drug use and drinking, wild orgies and violent occult rituals, including animal sacrifices. In 2002, he legally changed his name to Pazuzu Algarad as a nod to the Assyrian King of Demons, who's mentioned in the Exorcist movie. Algarad only bathed once a year because he believed that washing stripped the body of its natural defenses against illness. Despite this, though, Algarad attracted a dedicated following of young women who practically threw themselves at him whenever the opportunity presented itself. Algarad couldn't have smelled any worse than the interior of his house, which was covered in animal carcasses, mold, broken glass, dirty dishes, bugs, and piles of waste from both humans and pets who regularly relieved themselves on the floor. A lot of the people who hung out at the house immediately noticed the stench before they even reached the front door, but they were apparently willing to fight their gag reflexes in order to hang out with Algarad. 
He was a big talker, so his friends weren't sure whether to believe him or not when he began claiming that he'd murdered several people. Acting on tips, authorities dug up his yard in 2014 and found the skeletal remains of two missing men named Joshua Frederick Wetzler and Tommy Dean Welsh, who'd both disappeared six years earlier. Algarad was arrested on suspicion of murder, but died in custody a year later while awaiting trial. One of his girlfriends, Amber Birch, pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 30 to 39 years in prison. A third suspect, Crystal Matlock, pleaded guilty to accessory after the fact and received a prison sentence of roughly three to five years. Algarad's House of Horrors was demolished in 2015, while neighbors gathered around and cheered in celebration of its removal. Number 2. Gerald Robinson A Catholic nun named Sister Margaret Ann Paul was brutally murdered in the chapel of a hospital in Toledo, Ohio in 1980. She was just a day away from her 72nd birthday when someone strangled her and stabbed her at least 31 times. Her stab wounds formed a pattern of an inverted cross, which investigators believed was done either to humiliate her in death or as part of a satanic ritual, or perhaps both. Other clues at the scene hinted at the possibility of a ritualistic killing, but there was little forensic evidence. In the weeks following Paul's murder, police questioned Father Gerald Robinson, the acting chaplain at the hospital where the crime occurred, and the presiding priest at Paul's funeral. Robinson was a pillar of the community, but he seemed strangely unfazed right after Paul's body was discovered. The police chief, a devout Catholic, cut the interview short, much to the dismay of detectives, and Robinson was left alone after that, and around the same time, certain documents allegedly disappeared from the case file. By then, some people already had their suspicions about the priest and a possible cover-up scenario. But the case languished at a standstill until 2003, when a woman dubbed Survivor Doe accused Robinson and others of satanic ritual abuse against her years earlier. Her case was dismissed, though, because it exceeded the time limit for pursuing the crimes she claimed were committed against her. However, it prompted detectives to revisit Powell's murder. Investigators took a detailed look at the evidence, re-interviewed witnesses, and even had Powell's body exhumed. And thanks to new technology and intensive scrutiny, detectives were finally able to connect Robinson to the murder. The priest was arrested in 2004 and he was convicted in 2006. Prosecutors accused Robinson of becoming fed up with Powell's nitpicking and killing her after an argument. A book about satanic practices was found in his home, but it's unclear whether he was actually practicing it or if he staged a crime scene to look like a ritual murder as a way to mislead investigators. In the end, Robinson was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison, where he died from a heart attack in 2014. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. Number one, Boris Kondrashin. Back in 2000, a Russian teenager named Boris Kondrashin was sentenced to a psychiatric hospital for killing and dismembering a classmate in a ritualistic murder two years earlier. The self-proclaimed vampire had lured the victim to his home where he injected him with a sedative before cutting his body up with a hacksaw. He then drank his victim's blood from a silver goblet. He also ate part of the victim's liver and preserved the man's heart and one of his eyeballs. Kondrashin told investigators that the devil had told him to commit the murder, and a hit list found by investigators revealed that he had plans to kill more victims. He was confined to an institution after experts for the court concluded that he was too mentally ill to understand the wrongfulness of his actions. Ten years later, though, doctors decided that he'd been restored to sanity, and he was released back into society. Having come from a wealthy family, Kondrashin used his connections to acquire fake medical papers certifying him to work as a doctor. Then, over a period spanning at least two and a half years, he held various positions at several hospitals through Chelyabinsk, including as a general practitioner, a psychiatric counselor, and a drug and alcohol specialist. In the meantime, he received a monthly disability payment for his mental illness. Both his family and the government were unaware that he was posing as a doctor, 
even after a photo of him appeared on a provider's webpage. A woman who'd been on Kondrashin's hit list was horrified when she crossed paths with him at his workplace. Knowing that Kondrashin only had a high school education, she tried telling the authorities that he wasn't a real doctor, but a deranged killer who'd committed a gruesome murder. His documents seemed so authentic that nobody believed her at first, but locals continued to recognize him and his fraud was finally exposed in 2019. Kandrashen was obviously removed from his job and hopefully authorities have kept a closer eye on him. His sister told the press that Kandrashen was supposed to be under some level of supervision and that he was required to visit his psychiatrist regularly. But she was left doubting that her brother had been properly looked after, considering how long he got away with playing doctor. When the story broke, an investigation was underway to determine whether Kondrashin had harmed any of the patients he treated throughout his time as an unqualified physician. But there have been no updates since, and in this case, no news is likely good news. 9. Freak Escalator Accident In what can only be described as a truly bizarre and horrifying freak accident, a young Australian woman named Nikia Killick fell over an escalator handrail and plunged two stories to the ground. To make it even more tragic, she was celebrating her birthday in 2016. The incident happened at a shopping mall in the Gold Coast suburb of Broadbeach, leaving the 29-year-old with brain swelling and bleeding, broken ribs, a broken pelvis, and broken facial bones. Nikia's road to recovery was long and painful. She spent several days in a medically induced coma and was still hospitalized and unable to walk weeks after the fall. Due to her injuries, she had to learn how to walk all over again and struggled with certain things like spelling simple words and having conversations. In a piece written for the Same Here Mental Health Movement webpage two years after the accident, Nikia wrote that in some ways, the mental and emotional challenges were worse than the physical obstacles she faced. She described feeling like nobody understood what was going on inside her mind, experiencing crippling anxiety, and wanting to sleep her life away while also being traumatized by nightmares. By the time she wrote the article, she was doing a lot better but it took tremendous determination and support to get to and stay in a better place. 8. Reporter Ruffles Feathers While working on a piece about political corruption in the Ivory Coast in 2004, investigative journalist Guy Andre Kiefer was abducted from a shopping mall parking lot. Witnesses claimed that he was snatched by as many as eight uniformed men in the country's capital. At the time, Kiefer was investigating money laundering and other alleged financial crimes that the government was accused of committing, as well as the country's cocoa trade, which allegedly poured its profits into the gun trade. He went to the mall to meet with someone claiming to be a source, but in hindsight, it appeared to have been a setup. The source, Michel Legre, was the brother-in-law of the country's first lady. He was arrested in connection with Kiefer's abduction and reportedly ratted on several government officials during police questioning. But he and all other suspects were eventually released, and their cases were dropped due to a lack of evidence. In the days leading up to the kidnapping, Kiefer had told his family that he was becoming increasingly concerned about his safety. He had been in the Ivory Coast for two years, but had only recently started receiving threats. He hasn't been seen since the abduction, and the case appears no closer to being solved now than it was after it first happened. Detectives remain open-minded to several possible motives, including personal financial gain, state-sponsored retribution, or a grudge. Most people believe Kiefer is dead, but his wife, Assange, told the Committee for Protecting Journalists that she plans to hold out hope until or unless her husband's remains are found. 7. Drunk Parenting in Mall Parking Lot One evening in 2016, police found two young mothers behaving strangely in the parking lot of a mall in Salem, New Hampshire. They would later accuse 22-year-old Bailey LeColst and 24-year-old Amber Giordano of being drunk out of their minds. They were so drunk they could barely stand up, 
As the officers approached, they noticed one of the women lying on her back in a mud puddle and holding her child above her head. The women allegedly admitted to drinking alcohol and were each charged with one count of endangering the welfare of a child. They were then taken into custody and were later released without bail, pending the outcome of their cases, and their children were handed over to the care of family members. The case was also reported to the state's Child Protection Agency. 6. Secret Living Space In 2003, an artist named Michael Townsend set up a secret apartment inside the parking garage of a Rhode Island mall. He collaborated with seven other artists to make the 750 square foot, 70 meters squared space livable. And they took turns living there for three weeks at a time. Hidden behind a utility door and a cinder block wall, the apartment was fully furnished and even had a china cabinet and a PlayStation 2. There was no running water, so the occupants used the mall's bathrooms. Townsend would later claim that he was inspired by an advertisement that mentioned how neat it would be to live at the mall, and that he wanted to better understand life as a shopper. At the very least, it was the story he gave after mall security caught him and another artist trespassing on the property in 2007, bringing their unconventional experiment to an end. According to Providence Place mall spokesman Dante Bellini Jr., the so-called apartment was little more than a space filled with stuff. But several members of local law enforcement were admittedly intrigued enough to come and check the site out, and some reportedly even seemed impressed that the artists had managed to trespass on private property for four years before they were noticed. Townsend and his ex-wife took the rap for the entire group and were the only ones charged in the case. He luckily managed to avoid jail time and was sentenced to probation. But the legal consequences seemed like a secondary concern to Townsend, who was more disappointed that he fell short of his goal to turn the space into a fully functioning apartment. 5. Fort Worth Missing Trio Mary Rachel Trilka, Lisa Renee Wilson, and Julianne Mosley went shopping together at a mall in Fort Worth, Texas on the day before Christmas Eve in 1974. They didn't plan to stay past 4 o'clock p.m. because they had other plans for that evening. So their families were quick to call the police when they didn't return home. The women were never seen or heard from again, and their disappearance remains a mystery to this day. Authorities initially assumed they were runaways, a belief that seemed to be supported by a letter Rachel Trilka's husband, Tommy, received the next morning, saying that the trio had gone to Houston. Their loved ones would later claim that the police continued refusing to take the case seriously, even after the car the women had driven to the mall was found abandoned in the parking lot. Numerous handwriting experts have examined the letter received by Tommy Trilka, only to determine that the results were inconclusive. The women's families never believed Rachel wrote the note, or that she and her friends ran away. They eventually hired a private detective, John Swaim, who took his own life four years later and left behind a note ordering for the case file to be destroyed. In the years since, several investigators have been assigned to the case. Acres upon acres of land have been combed through. Cars have been pulled from rivers, and suspects have been investigated, only to be ruled out. Nearly 50 years later, the women's families continue to hold out hope that evidence will be found or someone with key information will finally come forward and help deliver long-awaited answers. 4. Dangerously Distracting Photo Shoot During a photo shoot outside a Pittsburgh strip mall in 2017, 22-year-old Chelsea Guerra, better known by her modeling name Fox Jane, posed in nothing but thigh-high stockings and stilettos in broad daylight. She was hired for the gig by a 64-year-old photographer named Michael Warnock, and neither of the two seemed the least bit bothered that what they were doing might offend some bystanders, or that there was a children's clothing store nearby. Not surprisingly, police stopped to question the pair 
who reportedly insisted that their activities were strictly professional and artistic. Guerra and Warnock were initially charged with criminal solicitation and conspiracy, but pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of disorderly conduct, sparing them from prison time and slapping them with a $300 fine each. Speaking with local station WTAE, Guerra said that she started modeling to put herself through college and that she was truly sorry if she offended anyone. In hindsight, she admitted that she and Warnock should have probably chosen a less conspicuous place to hold the photo shoot. 3. Baby Snatcher Strikes In what a judge later described as every mother's worst fear, a woman named Sherry Amour befriended the mom of a newborn at a mall in Prussia, Pennsylvania one day in 2016. After inviting the woman to eat together in the food court, Amour snatched the seven-week-old and fled the scene. By then, Amour had allegedly been faking a pregnancy to her family and friends for at least seven months and had taken the ruse so far that she allowed her loved ones to throw her a baby shower. With over 100 guests in attendance, when she arrived at her parents' house with the baby she stole, she claimed the infant had been taken away from her at birth after testing positive for drugs, but that the authorities had given the child back to her. But it wasn't long before Amour's family grew suspicious and tipped off the police, who tracked the suspect down at her apartment hours after the incident and arrested her for kidnapping. Thankfully, the baby was unharmed and was reunited with his mother, who probably hasn't let him out of her sight ever since. Amour's defense lawyer argued that his client was grieving the loss of her own child when she committed the crime. In the throes of a mental breakdown, she believed the little boy was hers. Prosecutors painted a more diabolical picture, claiming that Amour enjoyed the attention she got during her alleged fake pregnancy. She pleaded guilty of kidnapping and child concealment and was sentenced to one and a half to seven years in prison. At her sentencing, Amour admitted to stealing the baby and apologized for her actions. Two, the Springfield Mall abduction. 60-year-old Barbara Bobby Bosworth was walking to her car after a shopping trip to the Springfield Mall in Virginia in 2008, when two young men abducted her at gunpoint with a BB gun they stole from the sporting goods store. Mall security failed to stop the theft or kidnapping, and the company would later successfully argue in court that it had no duty to keep Bobby safe under Virginia law. The kidnappers, later identified as Lutchman Chandler and Keith Bakersville, forced Bobby into her car and drove to a convenience store in Prince William County, where they tried to withdraw money from an ATM using her credit card and then forced her to buy beer. Employees noticed that the victim was in distress and begged their manager to dial 911 or to let them call the police. He allegedly said no, but a bystander dialed 911. While inside the store, Bobby called her husband and used coded language to let him know something was wrong. He called the police, but by the time they caught up with the perpetrators and their captive, they had crashed the car into a grove of trees. Bobby and Chandler died from their injuries. Bakersville suffered a severe head injury, which only worsened his existing mental health issues. The tragedy left many wondering why more wasn't done to stop the kidnappers or to put a stop to the ongoing problem of violence at the mall where Bobby was abducted. People also questioned why nobody did more to intervene at the convenience store, where the terror on Bobby's face could be seen plain as day. It seemed to a lot of people like there were numerous missed opportunities to save her life, even if it was technically nobody's duty to step in. 1. Trapped and Forgotten During a visit from his home in Tasmania to Sydney, Australia in 2017, 71-year-old Bernard Gore got lost in a collection of corridors and stairwells at a local shopping mall. When he failed to meet his wife, Angela, as planned, she reported him missing. His disappearance was especially concerning because he suffered from dementia, 
and Angela knew he could have easily gotten confused. Police searched the public areas of the mall and found no sign of the senior citizen. They didn't check surveillance footage, which would have undoubtedly helped investigators find him much sooner. And they didn't bother looking in areas that were closed to the public. But Bernard's whereabouts remained a mystery for three weeks until a maintenance worker entered a stairwell and found his lifeless body slumped over in a partial kneeling position. An emergency door had shut behind him and locked him in. According to the medical examiner, it appeared as though Bernard had sat down in a chair that was found near his body, but at some point fell forward onto the floor. Sadly, Bernard's death may not have been quick and without suffering. Coroner's assistant Anna Mitchellmore said that he might have been alive for as long as a week after becoming trapped. If detectives had checked the video, they would have seen Bernard entering the area, which is off limits to the public and consists of six to eight miles, 10 to 13 kilometers of tunnels and fire exits. These passageways are typically only inspected once a month. According to a coroner's inquest, which explains why it took so long for someone to discover the retired barber's body. According to a coroner's inquest report, the footage showed the exact door he went through shortly before he realized he was in the wrong place and became hopelessly lost. A new team of detectives who took over the case criticized the initial investigation for failing to search more thoroughly before searching for Bernard outside of the mall. The coroner agreed and officially ruled that the death resulted from inadequate search procedures and ineffective communication. To prevent another needless tragedy from happening, he made numerous recommendations to improve searches for missing persons in New South Wales. Have you ever known someone who got sucked into a cult or adopted a disturbing belief system and became an entirely different person? Tell us in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.